Good afternoon, everyone. So we're really pleased to have uh, everyone here at the second day of our Enable Ottawa 2022 conference. Uh, so pleased to be here. Um, this is hosted by the Reed Initiative here at Carleton University. And I'm Tara Conley. I'm the Assistant Director of Research and Development with the Reed Initiative. And I and my uh, fantastic colleagues here at the Reed Initiative uh, are really thrilled to be uh, engaging with you again today around uh, the topics that we're going to be bringing up. We have some great speakers for you today as well. Um, I get the privilege of being here with you for the first half, and then to round that out, I'm actually co-facilitating today my co-facilitator, Dean Melway, um, who is uh, the special advisor to Reed and the founder, actually, of Enable Ottawa event. So you get to round out the day with him, and that's fantastic. I think that's a very fitting way uh, to, to end the day here. Uh, so you'll be seeing him a little later on today. Before we begin, I'd like to take just a minute to um, do a land acknowledgement uh, and really acknowledge that the, the land that we're getting a chance to do some work on today here as a team is actually land that is unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples. And you know that's very important for us here to be doing those land acknowledgements uh, as uh, signifying our commitment to reconciliation uh, but also we note that, you know, as important as land acknowledgements are, they're only one piece and one step in that, and that it's through our actions that we'll be able to encourage a more inclusive society. So I ask everyone to just think about that for a moment that, you know, that privilege of being and doing our work on this land right now. Some other things that I'd like to let you know before we get started with our speakers today is that there will be closed captioning happening uh, and ASL interpretation that's being provided. So that's gonna happen throughout the event. Uh, we'll share links in the chat to where you could actually access the live captions. And I'd also like to know and let everyone know that your microphones and your cameras have actually been turned off for you. Uh, so we recommend that you use gallery view for today's presentations. Uh, and that way you'll be able to see each of our speakers and the ASL interpretation as well. If you're encountering any technical difficulties or any accessibility issues, please, please feel free to reach out to our event support team uh, for assistance. For attendees who've joined us via the Enable Ottawa platform, uh, please type your questions uh, in the chat that's located uh, in the virtual event lobby. For attendees who are joining us via Zoom and the Zoom webinar, please feel free to type your questions and comments in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screens. That's really helpful for us because those questions will be gathered, they're sent to me and I'm able to give them to our speakers. We'll be recording today's sessions, absolutely, and we'll be in touch following the event to give you instructions on how to access these recordings as well. So the information today will be made available to you uh, at a later date for sure. Uh, now, I'd like to invite as an opener, um, His Worship City of Ottawa Mayor, Jim Watson, to deliver the Naval Ottawa Day 2 welcome and opening remarks. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't be here to join us today live. So what he's done is he's provided his welcoming remarks in a pre-recorded video, which we'll play for you. Hello, I'm Jim Watson, Mayor of the City of Ottawa. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the second day of Enable Ottawa's sixth annual conference. J'ai le plaisir de vous accueillir à la deuxième journée de la sixième conférence annuelle d'Enable Ottawa. Despite the conference being held virtually, it has proven to be an effective way to expand the conference's reach beyond our city and connect with accessibility advocates, collaborators, researchers, businesses, policymakers, and people with lived experience across Canada. This event was founded seven years ago because there was a need to bring news and information about uh, advances in assistive and adoptive technology 
to the accessibility and disability communities here in the nation's capital. This year's conference aims to achieve that original purpose. Throughout the conference agenda, participants have the opportunity to engage and learn about new areas of research, new technologies, new strategies for identifying and addressing barriers and areas for further exploration and discussion. This event speaks to a key area of focus for the Reed Initiative at Carleton University and echoed by the City of Ottawa to be active in our pursuit of increasing and advancing accessibility. We continue to seek and create even more opportunities to create accessible spaces, programs and services for all. Carleton University is a leader in accessibility, advocacy research and best practices. The City of uh, Ottawa and our residents uh, undoubtedly benefit from their national leadership. The City of Ottawa is also a proud partner of the Canadian Accessibility Network and we work to support the initiatives of the network including the development of the CAN Language Guide as a planning partner uh, in Enable Ottawa. The City of Ottawa is also recognized as a leader in accessibility and we remain committed to advancing accessibility for our residents, employees and visitors. We value the engagement and experiences of our Accessibility Advisory Committee, a group of dedicated volunteers who assist in the application of an accessibility lens for many city projects. The city celebrates Accessibility Day each year as part of our National Accessibility Week. And this event will take place tomorrow, June 1st, from 9 a.m. until noon. I invite you to join us by registering at ottawa.ca slash accessibility under the news and events headline. I hope that the information and research shared today will inspire you to continue uh, the conversation around uh, assisted and adoptive, uh, adaptive rather technologies and accessibility and innovative ways uh, that these can be uh, implemented in your work and communities. I wish you a great day and a great conference. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, à la prochaine. Great, uh, thank you to the mayor. Uh, we're really proud to continue Reed's very strong and long-standing relationship with the city of Ottawa. Uh, we're really grateful for your support in planning the Enable Ottawa event as well, and your involvement with the Canadian Accessibility Network. So lots of great collaboration going on there and we appreciate the words in the opening. Now, I'd really like to introduce our first presenter group. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, the team from McGill University's Shared Reality Lab and Gateway Navigation, who are going to share with us today some really exciting research behind Image, which is a new tool that's using sound and touch haptics to um, interpret and describe web graphics for people who are blind and partially sighted. So we're really looking forward to um, seeing this presentation today, hearing from you folks uh, about what's going on. Please help me welcome uh, Jeff. Uh, so we've got Cyan Kuo, we've got David Brun, we've got Dr. Young J. Yu, we've got Jeffrey Brun, uh, Blum, sorry, and we've got Jeremy Cooperstock here with us today. So we've got really um, a great expansive uh, group of folks who are gonna share their news with you today. Looking forward to it, take it away. and founder of Gateway Navigation. Uh, I, am, I am a white male. I have brown hair. Uh, sorry, I have brown eyes, uh, gray and white hair. Uh, I am blind uh, due to a condition uh, known as retinitis pigment TOSA, or RP. Um, also, on behalf of the IMAGE team, I want to take this opportunity to thank Carleton University, Reed, uh, the organizers of Enabling Ottawa Conference uh, for um, inviting us to participate in this National Accessibility Week event. And also a really big thank you and welcome to all of you for your interest and commitment to making Canada more accessible. 
the image project, which is also in its long form known as internet multimodal access to graphical exploration is a collaboration between McGill University's Shared Reality Lab, Gateway Navigation, and the Canadian Council of the Blind, CCB. Uh, the genesis of IMAGE started several years ago uh, when I attended a conference at the Vancouver Convention Center. Uh, the conference was Buildex and Myself and two other blind uh, panelists were presenting uh, on accessibility in the built environment. Uh, before I attended the conference, I went online to get information on where the room was going to be and where um, uh, the different architectural element, elements uh, of the venue were located. And I was able to find a PDF file which was the floor plan of the venue. Unfortunately, because it was a photograph, uh, this was not accessible to me in any form. And this is uh, an experience that millions of blind people have every day in accessing information on the internet. I was fortunate um, a few days later to be in a conversation with uh, Jeremy Cooperstock from the Shared Reality Lab. And we got into a discussion of how this could be addressed. And so after a lengthy discussion, and uh, we put together um, an application to get funding to research and develop a solution for this uh, issue. Uh, and over time, um, we eventually got the funding and we put together um, what is now IMAGE. Um, so 18 months ago, uh, this project began with us bringing together over 20 researchers from uh, the McGill University Shared Reality Lab, uh, with over 50 co-design participants who are blind, deafblind, and low vision from across Canada to create what we're bringing here today is a first step in how to create a more accessible internet, enabling people who are blind to share in the same experience as sighted individuals when you're experiencing graphics on the internet. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Blum, who is our technical project manager for IMAGE, to lead you through the technical and open source design of image. Jeff. Great. Thanks so much, David. Sam, if you go to slide three, please. So I'm Jeff Blum. I, as David mentioned, I'm the technical project manager for the image project at McGill. I'm a white middle-aged man. I have short brown and gray hair. I'm sitting in my home office here in Montreal. I'm wearing a charcoal gray sweater because it's a little bit chilly today. And I have a bookshelf behind me. And I'm joined here by Cyan Kuo, who is the usability and user experience lead, Dr. Yang Jiu, the haptics and sense of touch lead, and Professor Jeremy Cooperstock, who's the director of the Shared Reality Lab where this work is taking place. And as David mentioned, it's not just the people who you're hearing from during this presentation. There are over 15 additional team members at McGill um, who have contributed to the project. So I want to acknowledge that. So at its core, what is image? At its base, uh, image is a zero cost, completely free web browser extension for the Chrome browser, which means it also works in other browsers like Microsoft Edge, Opera, and Brave. And the goal is to take graphics on the web and produce novel audio and touch or haptic experiences of those graphics that goes beyond what current tools generally allow. So after you've installed this extension, it gives you a new menu option when you get, get the context menu on something like a photograph. And when you trigger that option, it takes that photograph, sends it up to a server at McGill, and then it creates through machine learning uh, tools and from rendering technique, techniques like spatialized audio, which let us make it seem like a sound is coming from uh, different places around your head. It creates what we call a rendering that's sent back to the browser where you can experience it. 
Image currently supports photographs as well as some charts and embedded maps. And we'll see some demonstrations of that coming up. The public beta of Image was only released in March. So it's only been about uh, less than two months, I think. And so we're interested in your feedback. We have a URL at the end of the presentation for our website where you can install the extension yourself, give Image a try and let us know what you think. And we like hearing about good experiences as well as things we can improve. So that begs the question, what does image add to all of the other technology that you might already be using to access the web and graphics on it? So if you're a person who's blind or low vision, you probably already use something like a screen reader uh, that takes text on the screen and reads it back to you through a text-to-speech engine. And you, you're probably familiar with alt text, which is text that's manually entered for a photograph by the person creating a website or the person who took the photograph to give some information about what's in that photo. And increasingly, alt text is automatically generated. So machine learning tools look at what's in the photograph and they create that text block automatically. And you can find that in tools like JAWS Picture Smart, where you can select a graphic and, and get an automatically generated alt text for it. And on mobile devices too. So for example, on iOS, the voiceover image description tool will allow you to hear about the different things in a photograph. But what's common to all of these is that they're pretty much text-based in that the model is the machine learning tools look at the, the graphic and then it creates a block of text that's read to you. And that causes them to largely focus on the content of the graphics and large, largely neglect the feel of the graphics. And I'll give an example of what I mean by the feel of it in, in an example in just a second. But before I do that, I want to say that image does not replace any of the tools that I just mentioned. If you use image, you're gonna to wanna to use your screen reader. You're still gonna want good alt text in, in the photographs for getting a general overview of them. And image is not an overlay to correct website accessibility issues. So we make graphics more accessible, but the site has to be designed with accessibility in mind. We're not a magic band-aid that you can just stick on a website and all of a sudden everything is magically accessible. In fact, if your screen reader can't really deal well with a web page because it is designed poorly, probably the image tools won't be able to do uh, much better in terms of accessing those graphics. So core accessibility design on the web is still critical. So what do I mean by the feel of a graphic? Well, here's an example. So what I'm looking at right now is a table of data that's taken from the Quebec website for the coronavirus pandemic. And so it gives statistics about how the pandemic is going. And there are two columns of data in this table. It's titled distribution of confirmed cases by age group. And the first column is age group. And the second one is the percentage of confirmed cases. So for example, in the first row, it's zero to nine years. And then in the second column, there's a nine say, telling me that 9% of cases in Quebec are in people from zero to nine years old. And then there's rows below that for other age groups. If your screen reader gets this table, it would probably do a pretty good job of reading out these rows one by one and you'd get the numerical information from this. When you go to the Quebec webpage, this is not what I see first. What I see first is instead, what I'm seeing now on the next slide, uh, which is a visual representation called a pie chart. And a pie chart is basically a big circle and it has wedges of different sizes representing the different pieces of data. And here, uh, visually, I get a completely different experience of exactly the same data, but what strikes me is completely different than seeing it in a, in a table-based format. So for example, I see a big green wedge here marked 20 to 29 years, and it immediately jumps out to me that that's much, much larger than the wedges for say 70 to 79 years and 80 to 89 years and 90 years and more all combined. And I get that at just a glance. And this is where a screen reader with just a text representation kind of falls flat. The designer of this web page decided this was the, what they wanted to emphasize. And they chose this plot format, this pie chart specifically to convey that. So now we're gonna play you how image would deal with this pie chart and what it would render. But before Cyan plays that, I need to point out that through Zoom, most of you will not get spatialized audio. It's simply a limitation of the platform. So you'll hear a sound in this rendering. And normally that would be going around your head. So it'd sound like it was moving around you in space, which helps reinforce the rendering. You won't be able to experience that over Zoom. So I would encourage you to go to our website where this is one of the examples after this talk, 
and try this out for yourself. And so with that caveat saying, go ahead and play that. Zero, nine years, 9%, 9 10, 19 years, 11.8%, 20, 29 years, 17.3%, 30, 39 years, 16.7%, 40, 49 years, 15.8%, 50, 59 years, 12.2%, 60, 69 years, 7%, 70, 79 years, 4.1%, 80, 89 years, 3.9%, 90 years or more, 2.2%, age to be determined, 0%. Okay, so what you heard there was the duration, kind of the intensity of that noise changing based on the size of each wedge. And what we're trying to do there is give an audio representation of what I'm seeing visually in this pie chart. So that I would argue that that's a significantly different experience and a more visceral sense of the data than what you get from just hearing the number, numbers from the table. And we'll give some more examples of, of similar things coming up. So that's audio. So audio is one part of, of image and it stands alone and it allows us to generate these renderings that are rich and often more concise. So for example, you'll hear an example where there's a bear in a photograph and instead of having to say the bear is over to the right and down in the, in the corner, uh, we can just say bear and make a little sound that, that indicates through the spatialized audio where that is in the image, in the graphic. But touch can add more on top of this. But before we see the demonstrations of the audio and touch, I want to make very clear that you don't have to have a touch device in order to use image. Some people come to our website and they read about the project and they say, oh, I can't use this because I, I haven't purchased one of these haptic uh, touch devices. They are optional. You can load image, run the web extension, and get the audio renderings. And then the haptics, if you buy one of these devices in the future, will add on to that experience, but it's not necessary to have that. Okay, enough of me talking. I'm going to turn it over to Cyan and Yangjae to demonstrate the installation, some of the audio experiences, and introduce the haptic devices. And then I'll come back with yeah, at the end of that. Go ahead, Cyan. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Cyan. I am uh, of East Asian descent. I have black and purple hair, and I'm wearing a blue hoodie with uh, faux fur trim. I'm sitting in my in my office, which has some a bookcase to my to my right and some plants. Um, I'm here to talk to you about uh, to actually show you um, image. And this is a live demo, mind you. Um, so if I'm a little clumsy, if I stumble a little bit, I'm very sorry. This is, of course, a live demonstration. And um, as we've noted in engineering often, uh, that's when things tend to go terribly wrong. Um, so I'm just going to cl uh, close this screen for now. And I'm here on our website. To get to the image, uh, the image extension, go to our website at image.ally.mcgill.ca. That's I-M-A-G-E dot A-1-1-Y dot M-C-G-I-L-L dot C-A. And under the heading image, making in internet graphics accessible through rich touch audio and touch, uh, you click on the link or uh, you select the link, download the image Chrome browser extension here. And this will take you to the image Chrome browser extension page. Once the page loads, select the link Add to Chrome. A pop-up menu will appear asking you for permissions. Just select Add Extension to download the extension and add it to Chrome. OK. So I'm going to navigate back to our, our website. And I'm going to just show you a few examples of, uh, of photos that we've, uh, photos and graphics that we've picked out that we think work particularly well. Um, so to use image on photos, uh, what you would do is open up context menu, like on the photo that you want analyzed. So simil similarly to how you would select an image to, to copy paste, uh, you would select, um, you would select the, uh, this, you would open up a context menu and you'll select get image rendering, all right? That's a new context menu item that appears uh, when you install image. So I'm just 
activating that now. And what this does is it's going to send the photo to the image server for analysis. I'll show you what I mean. Image request sent. Process image results arrived. Okay. So uh, a pop-up is now on my screen. Underneath the heading renderings um, on the pop-up, there are two interpretations. If you have a screen reader turned on, the first one will give you a plain text-to-speech summary of what it finds in the photo, uh, which is, in this example, um, number of peoples, umbrellas, traffic lights, cars and a bus, so on and so forth. So you can tell it's, a, um, it's an urban uh, scene. So uh, the next interpretation is uh, the bread and butter of image. It will convey the spatial extent of regions and the locations of things and people relative to one another. So I'm just going to explain what you're going to, about to hear. So in this photo, you'll hear buildings as regions because they take up a significant portion of the graphic. The spatialized sound is going to draw an outline around the portion of the photo that contains buildings by tracing it left to right and changing pitch as it goes up to down, right? And in terms of things in people, you'll hear a popping noise. And if you're wearing headphones and uh, depending on your Zoom setup, um, it will sound like cars are in the lower left of the photo and people are in the lower right. Okay, I'll just play this now. This outdoor photo contains the following outlines of regions, building, <laughs> car, and Cigna bird. It also contains the following objects or people, six people, two umbrellas, two traffic lights, four cars, a bus, and a backpack. So again, um, it, if you go to our website and you download image, give it a try, you'll be able to hear this cityscape. All right. Um, so the next, uh, the, uh, the, the next thing that I'm going to show you is uh, how we do in, uh, maps. So um, the um, I've got a I've got a um, an embedded map uh, Google map here of uh, the area around the Royal Tyrell Museum in Drum Drumheller, um, and uh, we've often heard about uh, how difficult it is to access information on an embedded map. And so you'll get a location, but you don't necessarily know about all the landmarks in the area. With this in mind, we made a point of interest type of experience. And to get this, I'm moving to this embedded map, and I'm selecting this button that's appeared underneath a map that reads get image map rendering. Image request sent. Processing data. Processing data. Process image results arrived. Okay. Um, with this experience, imagine that you're standing at the location given, which is the museum, and you're facing north. If you're listening on headphones, you'll hear jingles coming from the directions of the locations that image extracts from the map. I'm just going to play the sound now. From due north moving clockwise, there are the following. Badlands Interpretive Trail. Drumheller Airport. Historical Mine Site. Unknown Steps and Unknown Footway. Royal Tyrell Museum of Paleontology. Fountain Tire. Tough Mudder, Alberta. Munson, Ab. Long Brank Saloon. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Underground Galleria. Merle Norman. Eufa Cardlock Drumheller. Newcastle Country Inn, Vietnamese Noodle House, Tone Communication, Petro Pass Truck Stop, Midland Coal Mine, Triken, Country Road Verve, Drum Heller. Okay, um, and again, um, 
this should hopefully give you an awareness of where things are in uh, relative location, uh, relative to the location in the map. So uh, finally, uh, Jeff has shown you some pie charts, and now I'm going to show you, show you another type of chart, which is line charts. So normally, if you have a, um, a screen reader, um, you might get uh, X and Y axis values uh, and alt text for a line chart if it exists. So instead of hearing a list of values like you would in a table, hopefully with some practice, image will give you a concise way of perceiving trends in data. Um, image sonifies charts by sweeping from your left to right ear. And as the y-axis value changes, the pitch will go up and down. Um, I'm going to the Etherscan website and I'm getting a line graph of the daily transactions. So I'm just going to go, go to this website, yes, um, of the daily transactions for a cryptocurrency called Ethereum. So um, I'm now activating the button get image charts rendering and I've got another pop-up here um, Image request set. I'm going to get another pop-up here. Arrived. And here are renderings again. I'm clicking on um, on the first interpretation, and I'm playing the sound. Ethereum daily transactions chart. So, so what you uh, hopefully should hear, is, if you're wearing headphones, is you can hear the rate of transactions starting out really slowly, and eventually it picks up, and uh, there are many more transactions per day. And so I hope this, this demonstrates that what we've tried to do is provide rich audio that lets you perceive graphics in a new way rather than just hearing them described to you. With a little practice, um, I hope that uh, I hope that uh, this becomes a valuable addition to the arsenal of tools that already exist for those who are blind and low vision. Um, speaking of equipment and tools and interventions that are available to uh, those who are blind and low vision, I'm going to just throw these. Uh, going to throw the the screens, uh, the uh, PowerPoint back up, and I'm going to pass uh, it on to Young Jay, who is going to talk to you about haptics. Am I PT for multiple? Oh, right, okay, yeah. Thank you, Sayan. Yeah, hi, my name is Young Jay Yu and I'm haptics lead of the image project. I'm a Korean man in my 30s with a medium long black hair, wearing glasses and uh, wearing a white shirt. Um, I'm sitting in my home office with the shelf and the um, doors behind me. Well, I'll just uh, start my story about the touch experience of the image. Imagine you are touching something with your hands, let's say a sculpture. While you are touching that, um, you can easily feel its shape and geometry via your hand. Recalling the uh, middle school physics, when you touch and press an object, the reaction force pushes your hands and you can feel the object presence. In addition, the microstructure of its surface gives you texture sensation when you are stroking over that, such as a stone-like, wood-like sensations, and so on. So such experiences are the images that haptic feature pursues. Producing, uh, uh, next slide please, and uh, producing the artificial force and the tactile senses by um, haptic devices and providing them to build and uh, the, them to the blind and low vision users to get the sense of the images. The typical example would be the um, um, tactile maps and graphics, which are widely used in the blind library or public places to help the users, uh, which is in the left panel of the picture and this slide. And in addition to them, we have another idea, so-called haptic guidance. The middle panel of uh, the picture describes uh, the wire made of, for the children as a toy. The, uh, the tangible object can be moved along the wire only, and the um, children can feel its trajectory, how it moves. You can also think of uh, the, the guided drawing of children, or for the adults, let's say go for violin lessons. Um, experts guide your the, the trajectory 
to move the tools like a crayon or golf clubs or violin bow in a correct manner. We attempt to um, realize such idea uh, with two different kinds of haptic devices. I prepared a video for you to show how it works. This video shows the haptic experience of the image project with two different devices, the Haply 2 DIY and the DotPad. The Haply 2 DIY is a small desktop robotic device made by Haply in Montreal, Canada. It sits flat on a tabletop, and consists of two small robotic arms connected to a small knob, about the size of a ping-pong ball. The motors can either push the knob while you hold onto it to guide your hand to a new location on the workspace, or you can push on the knob and feel resistance when you move over a virtual object. This example shows a chart depicting the number of COVID hospitalizations in the U.S. from April to December of 2020. The 2DIY first moves your hand to the beginning of the graph, then pushes it along the shape of the plot. As the number of COVID cases goes up and down, the device handle moves accordingly. The next example shows how the 2DIY can help you understand a photograph on the web using the image extension. Here in our web browser, there is a picture of a bear in a forest. When you grasp the knob of the 2DIY and click start, you first hear the spatialized audio rendering of the largest region. This photo contains the following outlines of regions. Tree. Then, the 2DIY starts moving your hand, guiding it along the outline of the region counterclockwise starting from the top left. The knob passes the region's bottom, moves to the right, then moves up and to the left to return back to the starting point. Next, you hear the description of the detected object, a bear, and the knob moves directly to the bear's position. It also contains the following objects or people, a bear. The second haptic device is the dot pad, a tactile graphics display. It has a refreshable 60x40 tactile pin array, that can draw graphics on its surface by raising or lowering the individual pins. The segments and objects detected in a photograph are presented on the display, and you can feel and explore them. To increase intuitiveness, the segments and objects are separated into individual layers, letting you feel them one at a time. Here is an example of how dot pad rendering works. For each layer, the audio description and tactile graphics are presented at the same time. Picture of outdoors, total 12 layers, all detected segments and objects, earth, sky, mountains, trees, person, bicycles, peoples, bottle, backpack. You can switch between layers by pressing the physical buttons on the dot pad. Each layer presents a single region or object using the dot's raised pins, while simultaneously playing a spatialized non-speech audio rendering. Next layer. Pressing the next button on the dot pad switches to a different kind of touch rendering. Next layer. Start. In this alternative, we use tactile icons. Here, objects that are recognized by image are represented with simplified pictograms of raised dots, just as a visual icon is often a simplified rendering of a real object. This way, different segments and objects detected in the scene are converted into distinguishable tactile icon patterns. Next layer. All detected segments and objects, earth, sky, mountains, trees, person. Caption mode. Next layer. All detected objects. Bicycles, peoples, bottle, backpack. Tactin mode. Okay, next page, please. This video. Yeah. So that's the brief uh, description of the haptic um, rendering process of the image. As you seen in the video, we currently support two haptic devices, haptic 2 DIY and that pad. And let me show how uh, the rendering works. Uh, here's an example, a graphic of solid lead hearts. Okay. Um, we extract first features to be rendered from the web image and send the um, extracted information to the um, haptic device when the uh, device 
are available. For example, if happily is available, we either deliver a force queue to follow its outline or calculate reaction force to be delivered to users to fill its presence. If the dot pad is available, we convert the um, feature to tactile form and present on its device surface. Yeah, that's all about the, um, the haptics part of the image. And now back to Jeff. Thank you. Great, thanks, uh, Youngjae. Thank you, Cyan. <clears throat> So hopefully that gives you an idea from an end user perspective uh, how image functions. And we've said it several times, but I just want to say it once more. Through Zoom, you're not hearing the spatialization. You're not hearing the sounds moving around you, which is an important part. Um, so again, I encourage you to go to our website to try it afterwards. OK, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk to website creators. So if you're creating a website, what do you need to do to make image work well for your website? Let's start with photographs. So the important thing for photographs is that you make sure that the image can be selected and that you can get the context menu for a particular image, for a particular photo. And we run into problems in a few ways. One is there are some sites that make image carousels where you have a bunch of photographs that you can kind of scroll between. And the problem is that these will sometimes disable the context menu for the individual photographs in the carousel. In that case, you can't activate image. Similarly, there are some copy protection schemes that prevent the menu from appearing. Image does not work with those either. A third one that we came across is there are some sites that embed what are called montages. A montage is one picture file that contains multiple photographs laid out within it. When that goes up to the image server, it doesn't know what to make of that. So the machine learning results are sometimes very amusing, but rarely are they actually useful. So montages are something that currently trip image up. Last, don't forget that alt tags are still crucial for context. They can give information that's hard to discern from just looking at the picture itself, like what city it's in, for example. So don't neglect your alt tags. For maps, we image currently works with embedded Google Maps that are embedded through a, what's called an iframe. And this is the Google developer recommendation, recommended way to embed maps onto a website. If you embed them in some non-standard way, currently image cannot locate them and, and work properly. So on our website, there is a link to Google's developer site explaining exactly how to do this, but it's essentially put it in an iframe. And we're looking to expand beyond Google Maps to other forms of maps, but right now it's just Google Maps. And last for charts, we support a format from a company called HiCharts, where they embed not just the graphic itself, but they also embed the data that we need in order to do the rendering. So for example, the COVID chart that uh, was an example earlier, that um, is done in HiCharts, as was the Ethereum chart. Make sure when you're generating your chart to fill in the title and subtitle fields so that we can give some context about what this chart is about overall. We currently support high charts, two chart varieties. One, line or area charts with a single trend line, and second, pie charts, which you heard examples of. We don't currently support others like bar charts or candlestick charts. We're working on those, but they're not there yet. In the future, we'd like to have other chart variations like those, but one of the difficulties for us is that even within a chart type, charts can be wildly different. So for example, a line chart with 10 data points needs to be rendered completely differently than one with a million points. Because if we just rendered every point, you'd have to sit there for two hours listening to all these points, and that would be insane. We'd like to support sports uh, formats other than high charts. And in the far future, we're looking at things like automatic data extraction, where from just, a, say, a JPEG or a photograph of a chart, the machine learning algorithms would be, would be able to extract the data, um, and it wouldn't need to be embedded um, in high charts format, for example. We did a prototype of this earlier in the project, and we decided that the machine learning was not yet at a state where that was viable for public release, um, but we're hoping that improves in the future. 
Okay, so that was for website creators. Now I'm gonna go further and I'm gonna talk about what to me is actually one of the most exciting parts of the project. Because we know that our relatively small research team is never going to be able to handle every type of photo and chart and graph and everything else on the internet that's graphical. That would be impossible. So we spent a fair amount of time architecting the image project to be both open source and extensible, which are a little bit different. So open source, you can go to our GitHub repository that's linked in our website, and you can see and use all of the source code for the browser extension, as well as all the server components. So you can modify the way it works, you can compile it yourself, you can run your own server. So that's how you can deeply modify it. But in addition to the open source aspect, we also made the architecture extensible so that if you don't want to have to rebuild everything, you can just make a module that plugs into the system to either use new machine learning techniques or to make new audio and haptic experiences. So this could be, for example, if you're a research group and you do some excellent uh, machine learning that extracts details of say pictures of jewelry, and it can identify the stones and, and the shape and what type it is and everything. You could make a plugin module that just looks for those kinds of photographs and extracts the data from them. And then if you're a designer or an artist or a sound technician um, and you wanna work on the rendering side, you can use all of those machine learning outputs that are coming out to create new audio and haptic experiences using tools that we provide as part of, part of this toolkit. So for example, if you wanna do audio spatialization, you have access to a tool called Super Collider that can make sounds sound like they're coming from different places. Uh, there's a text-to-speech engine that you can use in order to render, render speech. So we've tried very hard to, to look forward and view the image project as a platform that can be built upon so that researchers and people who want to do new renderings don't have to reinvent the wheel. They can build on what's already created within image. And if you want to get a, a more deeper, more deep technical dive, I'll just point to a paper that we presented a couple months ago at the uh, Web for All conference. It's titled Image, a Deployment Framework for Creating Multimodal Experiences of Web Graphics. And that is a paper that goes into much more detail about, um, about the server architecture and how it fits together and how it works with the browser extension. So I won't go into those details here. I'm happy to take questions about it later or go to our website where all of these resources are linked. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Jeremy Cooperstock, the director of the Shared Reality Lab to talk to you about where we are now and where we see image going in the future. Thank you, Jeff. So you've heard a lot from Jeff and Cyan and Yongjae, as well as the intro from David, uh, leading into the technical aspects of the project and what we've currently accomplished. As a sort of broad summary, Image Today is available as a web extension that can be downloaded for free from the Chrome Web Store, as Cyan walked you through the process of how you can install that on your own browser. And I, I think our group is confident that what we have shown is that image is a decent beta proof of concept system that uh, enables and provides powerful audio renderings, allowing a user to gain a deeper understanding of web graphics content. Um, it also, uh, our experience shows that such a system can be realistically deployed as we have uh, making it available both uh, as a downloadable extension and as open source code through GitHub. Uh, but our audio haptic experiences, integrating that tactile dimension and the force feedback of one of the devices that we're working with have the potential of going much further. So as one example of how we'd like to take the project further over the coming months, uh, we started off, as David described at the beginning, in thinking about how image as a tool could support navigation tasks. And in particular, we were interested in looking at maps and how we could take the graphical map contents and turn them into something that was valuable and understandable by blind and low vision users. So although this is not implemented yet or integrated into the system, the example that I'm gonna play for you now of the Toronto TTC Metro map uh, gives you a concept for what we're hoping to achieve. 
Now, in this example, we're going to render the yellow line of the Toronto TTC, and it starts in the top left with the Vaughan Metropolitan Center line. You'll hear that being announced. And then as the sweep moves through the uh, the yellow line, you'll hear the pitch going down as the, for those who are familiar, familiar with the Toronto TTC, will know that it comes down from north down to south at Union Station and then goes back up towards Finch. And you'll hear tones indicating the, the sort of trajectory through that, as well as the announcement of intersection or uh, uh, what do you call correspondence points along the TTC line until wrapping up at Finch. And if you're listening to this with headphones, you'll hear the spatial representation, you'll hear the left to right or west to east representation as well. You won't get this, unfortunately, through Zoom. Uh, so if, Cyan, you can play the demo. Vaughn Metropolitan Center, yellow line. Spadina, yellow and green line. St. George, yellow and green line. Bloor Young, yellow and green line. Shepherd Young, yellow and purple line. Finch, yellow line. So that's, uh, as I said, a, an audio representation that we're hoping to have integrated in the coming months and be able to provide support for such uh, subway and bus line uh, maps. And also, of course, there's a, a good potential for adding a haptic dimension to this as well for users who have one of the haptic devices where you could physically and tactilely experience that, that layout and, and explore it with the audio being rendered in parallel. Uh, in terms of the experience of participants who have used the system or been involved in some of the user studies that we've carried out so far, the reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. And as one such sample, I'd like to play for you one of the feedback comments that we received from a participant in our studies that expresses and conveys some of the enthusiasm that the participant community has shared with us. Hello, my name is Joshua Simmons. I am a uh, clinical psychologist. I am also vision impaired, diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised to be a part of such an important study. I thought the uh, acoustic mapping was a pivotal piece of uh, information uh, that is commonly underutilized for people who have a vision impairment. Um, the, uh, the sense of yourself in the world and where things are relative to others is something that sound cannot uh, be rivaled by. Um, it is a unique opportunity to engage in your environment uh, on a level that puts you on an equal playing field compared to uh, other types of devices technologies. Thank you. And I apologize. I just realized that I've broken the rule that I reminded all of our team members to recall to introduce yourself and describe yourself at the beginning. So uh, stepping back a moment, I'm a 50 something white male, follically challenged, uh, sitting in my home office wearing a blue striped uh, shirt, t-shirt, even though it may be a little cool outside, it's warm inside in my home office, and I have a green yucca plant beside me. Uh, so uh, apologies for not getting that uh, out of the way at the beginning. Uh, so that's a little bit about the, uh, the past and a little bit about the future. And as an another point with regard to the near-term future of our project, some of the key items that we're looking to uh, integrate and add to include improving the machine learning and data extraction elements of the project, which are critical to uh, some of the experiences in particular with regard to understanding of photographs. Um, and those are rudimentary at present, and we believe they can be significantly enhanced in the coming uh, months and year. Uh, we'd also like to flesh out the audio and haptic experiences. Uh, for example, the, the TTC demo that you heard previously and integrating uh, greater richness of the haptic interaction. And finally, uh, handling additional data types. So as Jeff noted, we do a rudimentary job on photographs, 
We have some basic chart capability, but we're really, and, and the maps experience as well. We're hoping and looking forward to adding more different, uh, more types of data, more types of graphics that can be supported with additional richness, more depth to the content that can be rendered. And in terms of the longer term vision for where we're heading, we know from the participants we've spoken with that uh, support for mobile devices, whether it be Android or iPhone, is something that a lot of users are keen to have happen. And it's something that we would like to support as well. There may be the potential for doing that at least under iOS, uh, given uh, the recent developments from Apple's side. So we're looking forward to uh, exploring that as well. And embedding as an additional possibility, the image services directly into websites so that users would have access to uh, the full rendering capabilities without necessarily requiring the installation of a web extension uh, a priori. And finally, uh, we're hoping to add authoring tools so that users themselves and other content creators can be involved in designing new kinds of audio and tactile experiences for understanding web graphics. And this would involve partnerships with other uh, players as well, uh, as well as members of the community who uh, uh, want to play a role as developers and content creators. We could incorporate some of your contributions uh, as part of the services that Image provides. Uh, but beyond that, beyond what we've talked about today, uh, our team is very keen to hear from you and find out where you think uh, the image experience should go next. And uh, in that regard, we have uh, the uh, web-based uh, survey where we solicit information from uh, would-be participants and members of the community who'd like to share with us their thoughts. And we have contact link as well that I think we'll share with you in hopefully the next slide. Uh, so first our acknowledgements, I'll turn it over to Jeff uh, to wrap up with that and the uh, conclusion. Great, so yep, I just again wanted to acknowledge the uh, the project team. Um, you can also find all their names on our, uh, most of them at least on our on our GitHub, as well as our partners, Gateway Navigation, uh, CC Limited, CCC Limited, Community Contribution Company, um, and the Canadian Council of the Blind. And I also want to acknowledge the funders so far on the project, which include Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, as well as uh, the McGill Healthy Brains, Healthy Lives, Neurosphere Ignite Neuro Commercialization Grant, under which we're currently operating. And yes, we'd love to hear from you. Again, the website is at http image.ally.mcgill.ca. And you can also email us at image at sim.mcgill.ca. And on our website, Jeremy uh, mentioned a survey that we have. Um, you can go and you can fill out that survey, which gives us some information about what tools people are using. And it also serves as uh, populating our database for participants, uh, for participation in things like user studies. So we look forward to building image together with you. And with that, I believe we're ready to take questions. Great. So um, thank you so much for this presentation today. Uh, tons of really interesting information. Uh, for myself, it actually made me think very much around, um, you know, uh, the idea of uh, haptics and wellness. There's a lot of sort of things happening in the haptics and wellness piece these days. Um, you know, the idea of even a lot of apps out there for supporting people's mental health and wellness. And while those have uh, audio pieces to them, they also have sometimes some imagery or an images that come up to support, you know, folks who are perhaps in anxiety in a moment. There's all sorts of reasons why people might use some of these apps. So just very interesting around potentials there even, uh, with the haptics, because there's even emerging literature around haptics and wellness. So uh, thank you so much for all of what you've uh, shared today. So I do have a question here for you from the audience, and I will read it out to you. Um, uh, just to, I noticed, Jeremy, you said you had forgotten IAD as well today. So I'll do a quick describer of myself as for those who could either benefit from it or would like it. Um, so I'm a, a white cisgendered woman. Uh, I have blue hair, 
I have, uh, I'm wearing glasses today and a red blazer uh, behind me in my background is just a plain background of uh, brown sort of cupboards. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm pretty much wearing a smile because I'm, I'm loving what's happening here today. So our question is, uh, this might be a naive question, but how would one make use of this image software if you have challenges seeing to navigate it? So as I mentioned, you need to still use whatever tools you use to access the web currently. So if you use something like JAWS or um, NVDA, um, we, we test with those to make sure that what image is doing is compatible. So a typical path would be something like you would use your normal web tools to navigate to the website and do the installation. And then once it was installed, you could, for example, tab to the picture and hear what each picture is. And then when you wanted the image experience, it depends on whether you're on Windows or Mac OS, but there's a command key equivalent that'll bring up that menu and allow you to get to the, the option for, for starting image and sending it to our server. So we try to make it work like any other app would work on your computer, um, but we do test with uh, several of those screen readers to make sure that you can actually get everywhere using them, but pretty much just the standard tools you're already using. Great. I have a second question for you. Um, so how long has the development been going on to get to this point and also then where do you predict this could be applied in future work I, I realize you spoke to some of your next steps there are there any other things that you're percolating around future work oh boy you got another hour um so how long has it been so the project was first funded by i said and it, we started with nothing we met in a conference room with the team to say what are we going to do in march of last year um so it was a real sprint uh, getting to this point by then um, so in the future, as you said, Jeremy already talked about some things. Um, I am most, since I have the floor, I'm going to say I'm most excited about the platform aspect and some of the authoring tools, because we really, we know we're never going to get to so much stuff. And so, and there are a lot of projects out there that get started and they do some user tests and then they die right? They, they go away and you never hear about them again. So part of the effort here is to try and pull those in. So if I look forward a year, what I would be really excited by is if there were other research groups and other artists and people who are building content into image such that it can actually be deployed out for people to use and not just used for, for user tests and such. Mm -hmm. So that, that would be my perspective. I'll throw it out to the rest of the team here as well um, if they have anything to add on that. I love that community application and some of that co-creation piece too. That's that's fantastic. So anyone else from your, your team want to jump in? I'll, I'll add a, a note that uh, I subscribe to Jeff's enthusiasm for the, the ongoing uh, contribution elements and opening it up and seeing image serve as a basis for others to build upon and develop their own projects and really have that continuity. But at the same time, I think the team recognizes that what we have at present is, and it's a beta. It, it, Image currently provides some services in terms of enriched description of graphics that are on the web, but it can do, it should be able to do much more and that requires additional development for which our current team is probably best place to do so. And we're looking forward to additional funding. We have some that's ongoing right now. We have two more in the works, one that's, uh, hopefully nearing a decision uh, that will hopefully keep the project going for another year. Hi, and it's, and it's David. And the thing, what I would add as, as a member of the blind community, what is so important here is for people in the community to engage and try this technology and, and have a voice in its development. Because it, from the very start of this project, that has been a fundamental aspect is to get the end users to identify, you know, where we're doing things right, where we're doing things wrong, um, and also to experiment and try different formats and um, devices, which, um, you know, really require the blind community to give feedback on on how they see this being used. I think that's an excellent, excellent uh, place. So we're at, we're sort of at time today and I definitely encourage folks out there to be exploring just as you've invited them to your site to explore these types of things. Uh, I love that you're so open to the feedback and I think exactly how you ended there is, you know, it's 
incredibly important that these innovations continue to come from community and be informed by community uh, and actually, you know, invested in in that sense. Um, I also appreciated that you folks would love some funding to go towards this to take it even further. I think, you know, uh, it's, it's incredibly critical to to move this type of cool work forward. Um, thank you so much for all of your insights today. Um, and we, we really appreciate I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, more about how this is, uh, this is progressing. Well, thank um, you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to present to your audience. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank Great. you so much. You're welcome, Young Jay. Well, for the rest of you who are probably sitting there going, wow, this was awesome. You get to take a break now. Uh, we are about to head into our networking break. Uh, it's a short break uh, and we encourage you to take the time to you know, self-care in the way that you need to uh, so that you can come back refreshed and ready to, to hear more and engage more with the information that we have and we're sharing today. Um, for those of you who have enjoyed, who have joined us via the uh, Enable Ottawa uh, event platform, uh, you're really you're invited to go and network with our event host, the Read Initiative, and a representative as well from the Canadian Accessibility Network who will be there. So if that's of interest to you, uh, you can uh, jump over to the networking tab in your uh, screen. Uh, so it's in the screen chat, I believe. And for those folks uh, throughout the break who will be there, they can engage with you and, and feel free to contact them. Uh, we'll see you back here at two o'clock. That's when we're gonna be starting again for our next session, which is going to be approach to state-of-the-art customized assistive technology. So I will, uh, I will end there for now and we'll see you back here at two o'clock. Thanks to everyone.